is all. That's a talk show where and an interview series format where we are inviting influencers and thought leaders and veterans like yourself. You know who share with us your perspective, your views, your suggestions with regards to mediation. And in this show, in this format, we only discuss mediation and everything about mediation. And and to briefly introduce to the viewers, I think uh, uh, you may not require a detailed introduction. People know you. You have been you know a veteran in this area in the space of mediation. I continuously keenly follow you and your post. And uh, you know, it, it's it's really great to kind of you know, hear your thoughts. Very practical, and uh, I wanted not to be the only beneficiary. I want to let the world, like you know, I mean, hear from you your thoughts on this thing. So I'll be putting some questions to you, uh, with your permission. Sure. Right. Happy to be here, Sanjeev. Thank you so much for inviting me onto this program. I consider it a great honor. As you know, I've been to India twice and met many mediators and lawyers over there. And right. I think that the potential for mediation to grow in India is just remarkable. And anything that I can do to help that cause, I'm happy to do. That's pretty encouraging. And thank you for that. So Jeff, when I quickly went through, you know, the the, the, the profile, you know, on LinkedIn, when I follow you, it, it very nicely, it says independent mediator of business disputes, right? Now, Though I had, uh, you know, some already thought about questions which I would want to put to you, but I want to really start with this one. When you say independent mediator, I think that that's the whole crux of a mediator. Like, you know, he's expected to be, you know, an independent guy, impartial. We call him a neutral. And I've also read your post where you have been saying that, you know, you're not part of an institution, right? So you go solo. Uh, so, so would you want to dwell a bit on like, you know, this term independent when you use, I mean, why this extra emphasis on this term? Thanks for asking about the independence of mediators, Sanjeev, yeah. because it is, it is important. Hmm. We do have to be beholden to no one, truly independent, truly neutral. We have to disclose things if we have any possible financial interest in one of the parties, any personal relationship we have with any of the lawyers or the parties, we must disclose those things because we want people to have total confidence in our independence and our neutrality. So I find that I disclose things such as whether I went to high school with the spouse of one of the lawyers or the parties, sure. or perhaps somebody's kid played on a soccer team with my kid 25 years ago. I disclosed those things. Sure. Whatever I can think of, I disclose. And you know what, Sanjeev, sometimes I lose a case because of it. Uh, and, you, okay. and, I, sure. and that's okay. That's okay. Because Sometimes I've gotten a case because somebody else has made a disclosure, but I don't know that. I get but that. I'm positive that it's happened. Right. Nobody right. ever says to me, you know, Jeff, you weren't really our first choice. Somebody else was our first choice, but they had some conflict of interest or whatever. So we're going with you. Right. Nobody right. ever says that to a mediator, Sanjeev. True. Yet True. I know that it's happening out there. Right. And then in terms of a different level of independence, there are large companies that provide the availability of mediators. I've tried being with some of those companies, didn't work for me. Okay. At the most basic level, they charge extra money. They charge administrative fees or case management fees. There are case managers who are often interposed between the mediator and the parties. I don't have that since I don't charge administrative fees. I don't hire a bunch of administrators. Sure. So when somebody calls to schedule a case, they're dealing with me. And I'm able to start asking questions and start learning about the case and start mediating from the very moment the telephone rings or that first email comes in. Right. I'm proud to be as independent as I possibly can as a mediator. I think it's important to providing our clients 
the highest possible level of service. Got it. So great. So you gave me uh, the definition of independence from your perspective in two aspects. One is that independence of the parties. So you're not wasted in the result or the outcome. And there, the only point which I want to add was that any conflict which you are aware of, of course, we tell the parties, but as and when you come across, because it's not necessary that day when you are aware, but the moment you are made aware or you get to know, even that's a good point in time that, you know, one can actually explain or share that and, 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 you know, give them an option that now, since you are telling them, even if it's a halfway through, you get to know something about, you know, the spouse or a child working with someone, then, you know, still the call is the, of the parties. So that point, I, I would say that conflict at any point in time, when it is discovered, it better be told there and then. Oh, yes, because the last thing you want, Sanjeev, is for people to have second thoughts after a mediation. Yes. You don't sure. want people after a mediation finding out that you went to high school with somebody's husband or wife. Right. And then they think to themselves, the potential bias. Oh, he, you know, he, he came down pretty hard on me and tried to get me to pay more or take less. Was he doing it just because? He's been friends with this family for many years. You don't want that kind of second guessing. You want right. everybody to believe that the process has full integrity. I get and that. I, I think those kinds of disclosures are important. I get that. And, and then uh, just as a follow-up, Jeff, there is another element to this because this independence thing has been like, you know, brought up by some promoters, some entrepreneurs, some businessmen when I spoke to them. Now, there another apprehension is that, you know, the moment they would want to propose me, for example, right, as a mediator in one of their, you know, potential disputes, the very fact that, you know, there is one party who's choosing me, right? So I'm, I'm kind of, you know, giving my example, but I'm sure it happens with others. And they reach out to the other party and they say, okay, we want to mediate and we propose Mr. Sanjeev Ahuja to be the mediator. The very fact that they're proposing, the other party gets this view that because they already know him, Right. So there is, you know, some kind of understanding. Yes. Of conflict. Yes. He, he must be in their pockets. Why else are they proposing him? Why? Absolutely. So how, how do you deal with those situations? You know, somebody has to initiate, right? Yes. Somebody has to put your name out there. Agreed. So there are a couple of ways to deal with that, Sanjeev. One is, let's say I've done 10 cases with the plaintiff's lawyer. Right or a particular insurance company, whatever. Yeah. And uh, the people on the other side of the case say, will he treat us fairly? He's already done 10 cases with mm -hmm. this lawyer or this right. party. So I may say to them, I'll give you the name of the lawyer who represented the opposing party in case number nine and case number eight and case number seven, and case number six, and all of them if you want it, and call them and ask them, did Jeff deal with you fairly in the ninth case, in the eighth case? Because if I was able to deal with opponents fairly in the ninth case and the eighth case, chances are I'll be able to deal with you fairly in what will be my 10th case with this one particular lawyer. So that's one way of sure. dealing with it. Sure. The second way is to be familiar with both sides. Right. Sure. And that sure. is to go to the different okay. conferences. So, so uh, just a, uh, you know, a related question. When the process becomes slightly dragged or prolonged, right? Of course, as a skill set, we always expect a mediator to have patience and ultimate patience because, you know, you can't get frustrated even if you are, it cannot be shown absolutely, you know, through your emotions or on the face. Now, would, and, and when the parties are kind of in the thinking mode and coming to a uh, situation, whether like, you know, they are putting up a theatrical response or otherwise, would you want to kind of, you know, give them a benefit of doubt and say, okay, guys, you seem to be like, you know, agreeing to something. Let's talk about the settlement agreement or in spite of the drag process, you would still say, guys, why don't you take a break and think again? because we do not want any kind of a surprise tomorrow. So why not we kind of spend a bit more time? Would you do that or normally it happens? It depends, Sanjeev. Sometimes you get a sense that people are just exhausted. 
And some people get crabby and cranky when they get tired. And if you sense that that kind of fatigue is setting in, yeah, then you may be well advised to take a break. There's other times when you get a sense that you've, you've made a lot of progress, you've brought, brought the people really close together, and there's just a little more work that needs to be done to get together. Right. And you sometimes get a sense that if you let the people go home and think about it and say you try to follow up by phone or by email, you just get a sense that all the progress will evaporate. I you'll guess. be back to square one. True. And you don't dare let the people go. You just offer them another cup of coffee or another piece of cold pizza or whatever is around and urge them to keep going. So it's a judgment call and it has to be managed on a case by case basis. Got that. So case by case is the word and uh, because you get to deal with different people and even if I'm sure even if the people were same because of the different situation, different context, different facts, I'm sure the reactions and the responses will be very different. Uh, great. Uh, a slightly different question now. With regards to ADR, I mean as far as my experience is concerned, to the extent I speak to people, the moment you say ADR tools and tools for dispute resolution beyond litigation, and before you are stepping into saying mediation, there are people who jump in and say, okay, we know ADR, ADR means arbitration. Now, do we still have this gap in terms of understanding that though arbitration and mediation are both the tools of ADR, but these are poles apart, you know, collaborative versus it, the serial, you know, a binding order versus something which is like a pure, flexible, creative, out of the box thinking. Now, do are we facing this in the other part of the world as well? That you know, the distinction has to be, you know, more well explained, or maybe or, or else we need to do much more effort in terms of pushing and creating a lot of sensitization and awareness with regards to mediation. It's it's hard to generalize about that, Sanjeev, okay. and it's easy to over generalize. In the United States, we have 330 million people living here. You have many more than that in India. We have, uh, I don't know, a couple of million lawyers. I don't know how many lawyers we have here. And some people are very comfortable with mediation and know all about it. And other people are still trying to figure out whether mediation is the same thing as meditation. It, it's, <laughs> That's true. You know, there's people at <laughs> I would all, <laughs> all different, um, you know, younger lawyers right. take classes in law school, have taken yeah. classes in law school on alternative dispute resolution. Many lawyers uh, my age or older, there were no courses. It's not something with which they grew up in sure. the legal profession. They're, they're new to it. So there are also some geographic areas where some states, some cities where mediation seems more imbued in the culture of lawyering than other places. There are some subject matter areas of the law where lawyers have been quicker to adopt ADR mediation than in other areas of the law. So I don't want to overgeneralize about it. Sure. I can tell you, I can tell you that I feel very blessed that I'm pretty busy okay. and I managed to make a living doing this. Lovely. So there's enough, enough lawyers to <laughs> keep that, me busy and, and many other mediators too. There are a lot of mediators who are uh, supporting their families doing this kind of work Great. here in the United Great. States. Great. So it's clearly reached a critical mass here. Great. And it's a slow, can be a slow process because you're asking people to change a system, change a set of processes with which they think it works reasonably well, you know, and in the United States and perhaps in India too, I can tell you what did not happen. Hmm. It's, this never happened. 
where the senior litigation partners of all the major law firms got together for dinner one night and had a conversation like, you know, we can't get our cases settled. What we need to do is promote the invention of a whole new profession and let's call them mediators. And these will be people who will help us negotiate with each other and help us deal with our clients better and help us get cases settled. Now, how can we invent this profession? Sanjeev, that never happened, never. Right, right. It's always been mediators trying to convince right. lawyers sure. that we have something to offer and they should pay for it and it would benefit them and their clients in many ways. Sure. And for the litigators, it's, it's, you know, it's sort of like, oh yeah, and you probably think I need more life insurance too. And it's, it's an imposition in some ways. It's, so it's a slow process, particularly at the beginning of the legal profession right. to accept, to start buying what we are uh, so eagerly and enthusiastically offering. Great. So it's a hard now. sell for the mediators, hard sell at for the, now. At the start, it is. It is. Yeah. Right. And, and would you see that, you know, the codification, because as we speak today, the mediation bill is being discussed in the parliament in India. This is thanks to the Singapore Convention on Mediation. You know, so India has been a signatory and now we are hopefully like, you know, having a law of our own uh, and then maybe like eventually we'll ratify the convention. But the codification of mediation bill, would you see it as something which is a positive thing, you know, at least in terms of sensitization, somebody will say, okay, you know, there's a law. My only concern remains that is it going to stifle the creativity which is required? Are we going to tell the mediator that this is the process, do this, don't do this? Now, does it really kind of, you know, I mean, help the, for sure, one help comes as a push from the government. But, but does it kind of you know, going to impact? Because we have seen arbitration, for example, you know, getting stifled in terms of what it meant to be. And then it became a drag process, got into procedural lapses and stuff like that. And the intervention of the judiciary and, and, and you know, the court system. So is it some, so do you have a view on this for now? Sanjeev, I'm no expert on the proposed legislation in India. It's hard enough to keep up with what's going on here in <laughs> California, <laughs> much less the whole United States. And right, right, right. I, I don't really know very well what the legislation is contemplating. Mm. And it's also difficult for somebody from the United States to assess, or from any place other than India, you know, of course. To, to assess what is right for the culture of India, what would fit in with the way lawyers in India think about things and the way the court system in India operates, right. which is no doubt got some differences from the culture of lawyering in the United States or the United Kingdom or Canada or Australia or uh, Japan or any place else in the world. Right. And the court system has got to operate at least a little differently. So uh, it's a difficult no, absolutely. Difficult Point for an outsider to to opine. But no, fair enough. So, so my my query, my question was not a comment on the mediation bill as such. It was just that does codification of a concept like mediation, which is by the definition is pure flexible flexible stuff in terms of the approach or you know the give and take part of it or thinking out of the box and the party party autonomy and they're deciding. Does it really require a code? or codification so that you know you're putting up rules and regulations. That was the only point. So this yes, is I understand, at a macro level. Yes, I understand your, your concern that there's a risk that there would be kind of a petrification of mediation, a stiffening, and it would make it difficult for there to be innovations. Hmm. And, you know, we think we know what we're doing and we think we've got mediation we've got it down we know what it is we've been doing it for a while we also know though that there are generational differences in terms of attitudes and opinions and beliefs and what may be the perfect kind of mediation for one generation may not be quite right 
for people of a different generation, people who grew up with different experiences and have different different experiences of the world. So to codify something based on one moment in time may well have some unexpected consequences, unexpected negative consequences of limiting innovation when some adaptation is necessary. Right. No, I, I get your point. I mean, this was pretty at a macro level. Again, like, you know, I mean, somebody trying to tell us how it should be done, where by definition, it, it's something which should not have like, you know, any boundaries or limitations, but point well taken. So last two, uh, you know, quick questions, Jeff, uh, looking at sure. the time also. Uh, would you be a supporter of a training for a mediator? Because we've seen 40 hours all across the world. Like, you know, you speak to people, they say 40 hours. Are we discovering a mediator or are we creating a mediator after 40 hours? And is it possible? So there is a continuous process, you know, education, which, you know, I'm continuous professional education, if I were to say, that's more of a knowing what's happening. You need to know the latest, you know, try and speak to groups and, you know, be part of the programs, interact, brainstorm. So you pick up, you know, the nuances. But the training per se, is it something which needs a tweak or a 40 hour something, which is now the Bible for everyone? Is it good enough? I mean, any views on this? In terms of training, Sanjeev, we're always learning. Yeah. I've been a mediator for 27 years, full-time mediator now for 27 years. And I'm still learning things. I read books. I talk to my colleagues. People have new ideas about how to do things better. I sometimes have an idea about how to do things better. And I'd like to think that I'm a better mediator, much better mediator than I was after I first took a 40 hour training back in 1996 or whenever it was that I took yeah. that first training. Sure. And so I think that after a 40 hour training, somebody is probably competent in, to handle certain kinds of cases and maybe not other kinds of cases. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are just as if somebody becomes a judge, your first assignment as a judge is probably not hearing a death penalty case involving very complex uh, facts and law. When you become a judge, your first assignment may be traffic court, where you're just kind of learning how to run a courtroom and dealing with cases that are not so complex. Sure. There's nothing wrong with that. You work your way up. Right. So similarly, after a 40 hour training, you're probably competent to handle straightforward two party cases hmm. with modest stakes. Hmm. And then as you gain experience, you start working on more complex cases. It's the same thing as a lawyer. When you're admitted to the bar, your first assignment as a first year lawyer is probably not going to be first chair in a major antitrust trial involving the biggest companies in the economy. That, that's not how, what a first year lawyer does. <coughs> you work your way up to it. Right. So just right. as judges and lawyers and every other profession, you start at one level you work hard, you're able to take on bigger challenges, you develop better skills. So you take on bigger challenges and you develop better skills. Right. And you grow your way into a more sophisticated role, whether you're a mediator or a judge or a lawyer, or whether you're a chef in a restaurant, right? If you graduate from culinary school, you're probably not going to be put in charge of a Michelin star restaurant. You're going to start out as an assistant chef and yeah, then they work whatever, the and, then, and then you work your way up. So I, I think that's just the way of the world. Got it. Absolutely. Great, Jeff. So the last bit, your advice to two stakeholders in the mediation process. One is to the mediators, wannabe mediators, who are looking at you know making it a profession, a career. Right. I mean, of course, in India, it's picking up and like, speak. we have more seminars and more programs and like you know, people offering training. So that's happening on one side. But, you know, uh, you know, some advice from you definitely will come very handy. 
and also an advice to the parties in dispute who are you who still have some apprehension of the like let's wait either let's wait for the bill or let's wait for somebody else to tell us right and how do they take the first step so you know some something for both of them very important sure. stakeholders okay so let's first talk about people who want to become mediators yeah and i'll give you some advice that was given to me by a wonderful mediator a woman named lauren burton when i was considering becoming a mediator and we were sitting in a coffee shop in downtown los angeles near her office okay and she says you know i have breakfast in this coffee shop two or three times a week with people just like you who want my advice on how to become a mediator. Okay. She said, here's my advice that I give everybody. She said, at a certain point, you don't dare quit your day job because you need the income and you have to pay the bills. Sure. She said, at a certain point, if you want to succeed as a mediator, you have to quit your day job. You have to plant the flag. You have to burn the ships behind you. Sure. You have to commit yourself 100% for a few reasons. Number one, if you have a mixed litigation and mediation practice, there can be less motivation to develop the mediation side of it because you need to bill a couple of hours. You can pick up a file. You can call a client. Maybe the client will keep you on the phone for a while. You can record some time. There's always something to do on a litigation file that will generate some billable time and some income for you. Right. And if you have that there as a crutch, you will be less motivated to devote yourself entirely to developing mediation practice. Sure. The second thing is that people move up in the world of mediation, at least in the United States, the way, for example, actors move up. And that is you have to be available on short notice when the person they really want for the job is not available. So at every level of mediation practice, at my level as well, there are still people who have been mediators longer than I have and uh, get cases that I would love to have and I get some cases when they're not available on short notice and I am available. And that happens at every level of mediation practice. Okay. If you still have litigation matters and most people come to mediation from having been litigators, but if you have any other professional practice going as a litigator, the most prominent example, you have obligations on your calendar. You have court appearances, right. you have depositions, right. Sure, you have sure. briefing deadlines. So if somebody calls you and says, Sanjeev, I've got a big break for you. Uh, we need a mediator on short notice next week, Wednesday. Can you mediate for us? And it might be somebody you've been dying to have as a mediation client, a dream come true. This is a big break for you. Sure. But you have a court appearance scheduled that day, or you have a deposition or a briefing deadline and you just can't do it because of these other commitments, that will frustrate your ability to grow your career as a mediator. So it's difficult. You have to have some savings. You have to have some way to support yourself. As I sometimes say to people, while you're building the factory, you're not selling widgets. You're building the factory. And it takes time. It takes time. And committing yourself to it entirely at a certain point is, is essential. And in terms of your second question, lawyers, how can they initiate mediation without appearing to be weak? Here's the question I always ask myself, Sanjeev. For years and years and years, it has been the conventional wisdom in the United States, and I presume in India as well, that 90-something percent of all cases settle right? Do you hear that in India? Yeah, we do. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. how did those cases settle before there was any such thing as mediation? My hunch is that there have been millions and millions of times when one lawyer would call another lawyer and say, 
why don't we get together over lunch or someplace and have a meeting and talk about settling the case? This must have happened millions of times. Sure. In order for 90 something percent of all cases ever to have settled. Sure. So for generations, lawyers have been able to initiate direct communications with each other about settlement without shame, without regret, without fear of appearing weak. So whatever has enabled lawyers to initiate unfacilitated settlement conversations ought to allow those same lawyers to initiate facilitated settlement conversations without appearing weak or unable to take, take care of matters themselves. And so that's, that's the advice I would give to lawyers. Got it. And, and just a connected thing, I mean, time permitting, uh, parties normally are advised at times to bring their counsels in mediation. And then they are also told at times that you better go alone because you are the beneficiaries, you should be deciding, right? So the, the legal guy will probably you know, try, it, try and drive it the way it happens in a court or as a, you know, as, as a different process. So they at times are confused does it make sense to take the counsel with them or on their own? Uh, your experience on this? I think generally speaking, it makes a tremendous difference to have good lawyers there representing you. Assuming it's the kind of case where people are represented by lawyers and people yeah. can afford it. Right. It makes sense. For one thing, Sanjeev, the mediation is going to end if it ends in a settlement yeah. with people signing a contract. Right. Yeah. Contains the terms and conditions of the yeah. settlement. Right. The mediator does not have the same ethical obligations to you as your lawyer does. Your lawyer has the obligation to make sure that that settlement agreement protects your interests. Sure. Who's going, who's going to do that? It's not the mediator's job. The mediator works for both sides. Yeah. The mediator is not there to protect either side's interests over the other. And also for the mediator, mediators really should not be drafting settlement agreements, Sanjeev, because as mediators, we say we don't practice law when yeah. we're mediating. Right. And yet, although the definition of law practice can be vague in many jurisdictions, every place with which I'm familiar includes as part of the definition of law practice drafting contracts that affect the legal rights of other people. Sure. So a mediator who drafts a settlement agreement is practicing law. Mm -hmm. And sometimes mediators will say, oh, I'm just the, I'm the mere scrivener of the party's agreement. Sanjeev, I don't believe that for a second because the mediator in drafting the agreement is deciding how to phrase things, even how to punctuate things. If you have children in middle school, if you have 10, 11, 12 year old children taking English composition classes in their middle school, they are learning that where you place a comma can yeah, have yeah. tremendous impact Absolutely. on the meaning, right? Whether you use a comma or a semicolon, where you place the word only in a sentence can have <laughs> tremendous impact on meaning. Sure. Whether sure. words are phrased casually, phrased in the singular or the plural, can have tremendous impact on meaning. Right. And for the mediator to be making decisions on where to put that comma means the mediator is not the mere scrivener. The mediator is doing things that impact the meaning of that document. And so I think it's very valuable to have lawyers there. Sitting there it's right. valuable to have somebody there in your corner. So if you're, if you're thinking, gosh, maybe I should pay a little more. Maybe I should take a little less. Right. There's, you want to talk to somebody, no, somebody no. who's 100% on your side to say, look, I, I could pay a little more. I could take a little less, but I don't want to pay way too much more or take way too much less. Am I still in that zone of reasonableness here? It's one thing to ask a mediator who all else equal, we'd rather see there be deals than not. We think that's why people have hired us. 
And we talk about clear, strong decision making, and we're okay if people don't make deals. And yet, if we drive home, Sanjeev, and the parties haven't made a deal, we often feel a little bad about it. So yes, we are. We like to see deals. We do. And if you talk to your lawyer, who's just your fiduciary, has solely your interests in mind, you may get different advice. Right. Whereas a mediator may say, oh, what the heck, just do it. Well, your lawyer may say, and more correctly say, let's think twice about this. Sure. So having a lawyer there serves all kinds of valuable functions. Right. Well, lawyers, almost by definition, are not as emotionally attached to the case as clients. So being able to talk to somebody who you know is not emotionally invested or as emotionally invested as you are is a, a good sounding board for that reason as well. So there's all kinds of reasons why it can really benefit people to have their lawyers attend the mediation. Got it. Well said, but for the cost and if people can afford, then might as well. You know, it's always good to have, you know, a, a supporter, I would say in a way. That would be great. So lovely, Jeff. I think that's all I want to ask. And uh, we've already kind of taken a lot of time. And uh, but since this was important and, you know, one thing led to another and, and it may not be easy to catch you again, like, you know, so soon. But then I thought, let me try and run through all queries and questions which come to my mind. But that was lovely. And, you know, with your best wishes, I think uh, we would want to continue on this, uh, you know, on, on this initiative of ours. And any any parting statements you want to make? Otherwise, we'll conclude this. Yes, I just thank you, Sanjeev. I just want to express gratitude. Thank you for being such a careful and thoughtful interviewer. Thank you for inviting me onto this program. I hope it, it benefits people in India. Thank you. And beyond, as I mentioned, I've been to India twice, uh, and I've met so many lawyers, mediators, judges, and just people of India, all of whom have been very kind and friendly and helpful and, and gracious and uh, just wonderful. So I want to ex express my gratitude to your home country, Sanjeev, for the very warm welcome you've given me both times that I've been there. Sure. And I very much look forward to visiting you in India again soon. Absolutely. They say the people are, are wonderful and I just can't wait to get back and whatever I can do to help you promote the cause of mediation in India and beyond, I'm happy to do. So Lovely, that, with that, let me Lovely. Express, Great. Express, express my gratitude to you and thank you very Great. much. Great. That's a lot of, uh, you know, I mean, encouraging remarks from your side and we definitely look forward to having you here again and soon for sure. So thank, thank you, you, Jeff. Thanks for the time. Thank Pleasure. you. Thank you. You're welcome.